Good morning and welcome to MGBC. I'm Pastor Brian. Before we get started, we'd like to fill you in on some things happening here at MGBC for you and your family. If you have a child that becomes restless, we have a live feed of the service in our family room, located near the entrance to the children's wing. Two months after the July 1776 signing of the Declaration of Independence, George Washington's Continental Army found itself pinned against the East River by the British forces in the Battle of Brooklyn. The British had settled in to lay siege to some 9,000 Americans. Washington rounded up flat bottom boats, covered the oars with rags to muffle the sound of the oars in the water. Leaving their campfires burning to make the British think that they were still encamped, they silently retreated their way across the East River to the safety of Manhattan. To retreat means to move back or away from something dangerous, difficult, or disagreeable. In a military sense, it means to back away from the enemy in an effort to regroup, form a new plan, or to rearm for attack. There are many challenges and difficult situations that affect men today. We are under attack. Sometimes, like Washington and his men, we just need to pull back and reboot to get a new perspective, maybe even to join forces with other men to confront the challenges we face. Men, it is my hope that you will consider joining us for our annual men's retreat at Camp Manawagon. Today is the final day to sign up for the October 25 and 26 retreat. Dr. Randy Smith is our featured speaker. Brochures, which contain a registration form, are at the information desk. You can also sign up very simply by going to mgbconline.com and using the link there. Students, 10th grade and up, are welcome to join us. We feel strongly about how God is going to use this retreat to help shape our men into disciples of Christ, leaders in our homes, and in our community. This Wednesday, we will be having high school discussion groups directly after youth. Discussion groups are close to my heart because it's a time where our students are building community with each other and Jesus. Next Sunday, after the worship service, we will have our Skills for Your Bills fundraiser. Students are making pies, quilts, paintings, wood projects, and other things that you will have the opportunity to bid for. By you being a part of our fundraiser, you are helping our students earn money to help for activities that they would want to attend throughout our church. Please note these other events in the weeks ahead. Women's Breakfast with Bonnie Floyd is this Saturday. Light Up the Night, our safe trick or treat location, is Thursday, October 3rd. Go to the information desk or mgbconline.com for more information and to sign up. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. If you couldn't join us today and you're listening on the internet or if you're in the overflow, we would like to welcome you as well. So uh, a small confession here as an elder is that what, what we do here when we get up for the call to worship isn't our favorite thing to do as elders. We're not uh, glib, we're not always well-spoken. But um, what I would ask you to do is not pay attention to what we say, but pay attention to the verse. And what we're going to do here is we're going to hear from God's word, and that's holy and that's sacred. So as we stand up here to do, uh, and I would like to invite you to stand with us here as we do the call to worship from Psalm 145, 8 to 10. I'd ask you to put aside whatever is going on in your life and just concentrate on what God has to say to you through this passage. So, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your sa saints shall bless you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. I pray that uh, in my life that I would not take advantage of that, that I would not take advantage of your mercy and the forgiveness of sin that is so easily attained for us. Lord, uh, this says you're good to all. Uh, help us to take that example. Help us to be good to all not just to those who we think deserve your goodness. And 
then also I pray for maybe somebody in this room tonight who uh, is going through a trial that is not experiencing your goodness. And they may need the benefit of time for years to see why you could call this situation good. But I just pray for if, if there's that person here that they would just continue to believe, continue to trust in you, continue to be obedient to you, uh, that you would pull them through that time. And then, Lord, uh, we just uh, also pray here that as uh, the end of this passage says that all of your works praise you, bless you. That's what we're going to do here this morning. As we sing songs, we're going to sing to you. And as we hear from your word through the sermon, uh, we're going to praise you as well. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's worship together as we sing about Christ, our solid rock and our firm foundation. Please join us in singing. each other.
Good morning. It's great to see everybody. We have Dave and Sue Griffith here with us this morning, and uh, they're sitting right down here. They have spent uh, 40 years on the mission field in France, and they are retiring and turning stateside. And so they are stopping by various churches, but they have a thank you video that they would like us to see. And so, guys, if you would cue that up and go ahead and play that video for us this morning, it would be greatly appreciated. We work in the Burgundy region of France um, with the Macon Church right now, Macon Grace Brethren Church, which is the longest Grace Brethren Church in France. Been there 40 years, so we're um, happy to serve there. The Macon Church also is working on a church plant in the city of Tournu, where we actually live. And so we have a two-pronged ministry, helping the Macon Church to move forward in their leadership uh, to the next generation, as well as continuing to have a foothold in the city of Tournu, a city of over 7,000, 10,000 with its little outlying communities with no um, evangelical church in the area at all. We've had kind of different roles as the years have moved along in church planning and training leaders and making disciples. Something that's really impressed me the most is just wa watching how Dave works with people. He's kind of a quiet man and so um, doesn't attract a lot of attention, but he just generally kind of loves the people right to the Lord. I can remember being in discussion groups with people when uh, especially one couple I think of, we'd done Bible studies with them and we get to the end and Dave says, would you like to accept Christ as your savior? And he had said to them they needed to pray to do that. And the man and the wife both said, yeah, but we're both really quiet people and we're not ever gonna pray in public, like out loud in front of you, that no way. And I'm kind of like, okay, this is a dead end. What are we gonna do? And Dave just doesn't bat an eye and he just says, okay, that's just fine because this is not about us. So, um, I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to give you courage to do what you want to do in your heart. And then if you don't want to pray, that's just fine. We'll just go on. And if you do want to pray, that's fine too. And he bows his head and starts. And so we all, the rest of us all bow our heads. And he does that. He just says, Lord, you know, help these folks if you're calling them to be able to talk to you about this. And as soon as he says, amen, the man starts to pray. And he prays this wonderful salvation prayer. And then as soon as he quits, the wife prays. I'm like, what just happened there? Oh, I guess that was God's spirit working in them, wasn't it? It's been a real joy for us to be in places where we've seen God working above all that you ask or think and helping people come to him. It's um, not always been easy working in France, but we know the Lord has placed us there and we happily serve him there. Um, we know that there's many things that could discourage you um, even from making that step of wanting to to come to another country or go, go to another country and uh, work for the Lord but you know the the joys and the good times outweigh some of the things that happen so we just thank the Lord that he's given us the opportunity to serve in France and if he's calling you to France or to somewhere else, um, don't, don't hinder. Just follow what the Lord is laying on your heart to go where he wants you to go. And remember that there's never any place that you will be happier, safer, more fulfilled than where he called you. Even if you don't understand or if it doesn't seem like that's the smart choice because God's ways are not our ways, but his choices are always the best ones in our lives. We'd like to um, thank all of our supporting churches and individuals that have stayed with us over these almost 40 years of uh, working in France. We do feel like we're a team. Uh, you've always considered us part of your family in the church, and uh, we just wanna say thank you because it's a it's a big encouragement not to have to keep raising support and keep uh, doing things when you know that there's people behind you and that want to see things happen in France. Truly, we feel like any measure of success that we have had in the ministry 
has not been ours. Of course, it comes from the Lord, but it's been yours just as much because you gave to make it possible. You prayed to make it possible. We get to be the face here, but we're all in this together. And we thank you so much for your faithfulness. It has been a pleasure for Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church to support you over those 40 years. And uh, let's just give them a round of applause and acknowledgement of their service. Thank you very much. They will be here, so if you want to touch base with them or talk with them, ask questions, maybe God has uh, par perhaps led you to consider perhaps going to France. It would be a great opportunity to talk with them. They will be here following this service. But in addition to that, the Griffiths as well as the Howell family will be here tonight. 6.30 over in the multi-purpose room, we'll have our missions prayer night, and uh, we will be hearing more from the Griffiths with respect to their uh, work that they have uh, finished up there in France and what the needs are in moving forward as well as the Howells will be here tonight as well and they'll be sharing about their work in Zambia and so please feel free to tonight 630 to come back multi-purpose room and hear from both of those missions teams as well as uh, some ice cream as well I know that's that's a, a big pull there so I just wanted to make you aware of that tonight 630 in the multi-purpose room uh, let me see. We want to talk a little bit about forged and refined. I'm up now, right? I, I totally jumped that earlier. That's okay. That's I tried to make it look smooth like I did it on purpose, but I wasn't did supposed to Did you go back and like play with some tech I, stuff? Like yeah, I did. I grabbed a paper and I just sat down. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah really well. that's okay. Uh, we, we've been talking a lot about our discipleship vision here at MGBC and a forged and refined. And some of you may not know what those are, and some of you have questions. And so what we've done this morning is totally staged. Yes a totally staged question and answer session. So don't ask any questions because only the people that are supposed to ask questions have been told what, yes. right? And this is based on real life. These are actual questions that I've been getting. Right. But, so we thought we'd stage it and make but it But you look, don't want yeah. any spur of the moment questions. Uh, after church would be after great. Church. Yes, or, or email. Okay. All right, are we ready? So ready we again? Should, we should probably begin, right, begin by scene. asking you, what is forged and refined? What are forged and refined? Logan, could you type really fast? There, thank you so much. Uh, he's a fast typer, so he'll get the questions up there as, as quick as he can. Forged and refined, if you haven't been here, if you need a refresher, they're five-week discipleship challenges. We'll have two to four people per group. Uh, each of those groups will have a group leader that will have some tasks that we'll explain in a little bit. And the, the, the whole goal is to just build, um, or kickstart, I guess I should say, consistent habits that go beyond the five weeks. So we don't want you to start building habits of, you know, scripture reading and, and uh, relational things and then just quit after five weeks. The whole goal is to go beyond the five weeks. Terrific. Okay, do we have any questions? Any questions? Yes, Mary, you have a question. So how do the groups work? That's a great question. And Logan, you're so fast. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you for asking that. Uh, in a couple ways. So uh, primarily, we'd love for you to sign up and work in groups uh, out of existing relationships that you already have in the church. Some of you are already involved in life groups, ABFs, Bible studies. Maybe you serve in youth ministry. Um, pray about who can join with you. Maybe you want to sign up with your Bible study. Maybe there's somebody that you've tried to reach out to in the church or that you kind of had your eye on that you'd like to mentor. This would be a great opportunity to mentor somebody through this or work through it in a group of peers. So pray about that. Pray about who could join you with it. Um, and, and Jesus, he wasn't shooting into the dark when he called us 12. It wasn't like, all right, you, you, eh, I guess you. Like, he was very intentional about it. So let's be intentional about who we, who we ask to join us about this. Or if you're new to the church, or maybe you've been here a couple years, it's a big church. It's, it's hard to connect if you're not already jumped into something. Maybe this is a great starting point for you to, to sign up as an individual. We'll place you into a group, and then that would be a good way to connect that way. And then just a quick side note, too, group leaders, um, that could be, a more experienced believer, somebody that's walked with Jesus for a long time, working with a younger, um, less experienced believer, or it could just be a group of three or four guys or ladies kind of on the same level and you designate somebody as your group leader just because we need you to designate a group leader. Another question right here. Yes, yes. Ben. Oh. yes my brother-in-law, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Oh, please stand. Please stand. Okay. <laughs> Uh, when do forge and refine meet? When do forge and refine meet? That's crazy. I've gotten that question a lot of times. Thanks for asking that, Ben. Um, 
Forge and Refine don't have set meeting times. I want to make sure. I've had a couple people ask that because uh, I don't think I've explained that quite as well. There aren't set meeting times where, you know, 50 people sign up, all 50 people have to be in the room. You'll meet with your group. So it's either a group of two to four, and you'll set up a weekly meeting, uh, whether face-to-face -face or it, we're all busy. We have a lot of stuff going on. If you want to set up phone calls, uh, FaceTime, video chat, the, the goal is to meet once a week for, for at least 10 minutes so you're not just like, hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? Okay, bye. It, the goal is to at least talk for 10 minutes per week, catch up on how things are, are going. Um, let me read my notes to make sure I don't lose my place. Right, so if you want to meet face-to-face, -face, that's awesome, but it's not, it's not a requirement. Good question. Thanks, Ben. Jess. Somebody else? Rachel, yeah, you have one. Jess Never. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about the weekly homework assignment? I can do that. Thank you like so much. I'd like to know much. a little bit more about that. So what you're Thank asking you. is what do the weekly assignments look like? Um, Logan, I know this is going to be tough. Could you qu quickly type up what the weekly assignments look like? Thank you so much. He's just great. Uh, here's, here's some examples. That way you kind of know what you're getting into. Uh, so like a spiritual growth assignment, this is uh, a, a regular devotional that goes through the Gospel of John that Pastor Daryl helped me uh, put together. Um, relationally, you'll have some assignments to maybe pray with your spouse or a family member. If, if you're not married, uh, you would pray with a family member or a friend on a couple different days. Uh, maybe an assignment would be to hand write a letter to somebody that's made an impact on you. Uh, keep going. I mean, type more. Uh, physical growth. So there are some physical requirements to those that are able to do them. So, and they're not crazy. Uh, my wife and I have been working through some of these. I don't like getting outside, but then I get outside and I do like it. So it, it kind of forces you to get out and do stuff. Um, so maybe walk a minimum of one mile or 15 minutes a couple days this week. Or there's some nutritional goals that you can blame Pastor Brian for, which would be exchange your fluid intake to only water for three days. Now it's a challenge. Raise your hand if you like coffee. I like coffee. It's tough, but it's good. It's good to take care of our bodies. However, if you're under doctor's orders, if you physically can't complete these assignments, we have alternatives. They're not cheating. They're not replacements. They're alternatives if you just physically can't do it, and that might be memorize a, a passage of scripture and recite it to your partner, and we have a couple other assignments up there too. Is there another? I mean, yeah, good. Uh, there's a fasting component, so we're, we're each, as we participate, going to give up something for the five weeks that's become a habit or a mindless use of time. Uh, so it could be a type of food you could give up coffee the whole time if that's a challenge for you. Um, it could be a specific technology I'm going to give up. Um, it's, hard, it's hard if you work on a computer, but I could, I could give up internet use or uh, leisure time like TV. Something that gives you more time to focus on Jesus as we go through this. And then Lastly, there's accountability. We already talked about the groups. So each week your assignment would be to talk to your group, uh, either your partner or your group for at least 10 minutes. And then part of that is just to uh, discuss your progress in each of the areas and keep each other accountable and encourage one another. Um, oh, yeah, I guess not the next question yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, the points. You'll see there's point values um, put on, on each assignment. Um, so here's the thing. This isn't a competition. We're not going to have a weekly leaderboard out in the lobby so you see who didn't do their assignments this week. These are just an encouragement, a little bit of a motivator to stay on top of your assignments. Um, it's a good way for your group leader to kind of check in. Did you do this? Did you do this? And, and it, it turns into a checklist. And I know we say our Christian walk isn't a checklist, but it's good habits to start to go beyond the five weeks. Uh, do I have anything else in my notes? We will have some small prizes. Ooh, so everybody say prizes. Ooh. Prizes. Ooh. Thank you. Uh, if, you, if you reach certain point levels, and again, it's not this leaderboard, it's not this massive competition, but we want to reward you for putting in uh, time to, to develop good habits. I don't know what those prizes will be. It kind of depends on how many people sign up. Like if 200 people sign up, we can't get you all cars. I, I don't, that's not really an option. I don't know. That was a, I'd stay on the script. Okay. Let's just go to our next question. Next question? Yes. Uh, let me look at my script real quick. Um, okay, so I'm interested. What happens next? Thank you so much, Luke. What a great question. A couple things. The first thing you can do right now is go to the church website, to that address up there, or if you just go to, straight to the church homepage, you can click on discipleship. Or we have uh, kiosks in our lobby. Some of you have used them before, some haven't, but you can go to the kiosk and find discipleship there. Uh, at this point, you can sign up on our interest list, which is right on that discipleship page. And as soon as registration actually goes live, We'll email you or shoot you a text if you're on the, the interest list. Uh, and then the first week of Forged and Refined will be Monday, November 4th. So we'll run Monday to, si Monday to Sunday. 
for our assignments. Got to speak English. Uh, and the official registration will open next Sunday. Um, not like Sunday at midnight, because I'm going to be asleep. Whenever I wake up Sunday morning, I'll open it up for you to officially register. And this is 10th uh, grade and up? 10th grade and up, that's right. And so it would be if, if like a mom wanted to do this with her daughter, 10th grade daughter, yeah, whatever, absolutely. or a dad, they could do that. So maybe that's yep. an option for you. Maybe parents you want to disciple, enter into Forge and Refine with your 10th grade and up daughter or son. That would be, that'd be awesome. So um, that's all the questions we have. Thank you for Thank all you those so much, that wanted yeah. to ask questions. Appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, ushers, if you would come forward, we're going to have our morning offering. And uh, we want to pray for the Griffiths and their... Uh, transition to stateside, as well as for Lyle Lithgow and his family. Uh, many of you know that Lyle's father, John, passed away uh, at the end of this last week, and so we want to pray for them. So join me, please. Father, we thank you and praise you for your love for us, for uh, just the fact, Lord, that you are intimately involved in our lives. You want to know our joys, our pain, our hurts, and uh, that you care about the decisions that we make and the and the directions that we go, we just lift up the Griffiths as they begin their stateside retirement and uh, the transition and coming back. But Father, they've spent 40 years planning a ministry there. And so we just pray for leadership to step in and fill the void for individuals to come forward, for perhaps new people to be called by your spirit to go to the field to, to minister in France. And so uh, we pray for them. We also pray for Lyle and his family this morning loss of his father and so we just ask that you would provide the peace and comfort and the promises of scripture that uh, you are there with them father we worship you and we give back to you and we ask this in the name of your son jesus christ amen so as we worship through giving this morning let's just take some time to talk one-on-one -on -one to jesus maybe there's uh, unconfessed sin that you need to deal with right now. Maybe something happened this week, God worked in a certain situation, and you just want to take some time to thank him. You know, maybe you have a family member that you want to pray for. But let's just take, let's take some time, spend some one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. And we'll stand and we'll sing here in a couple minutes. stand together. You say come and I will make you fishers of men. So we follow you and lead We've already known your grace and we turn from sinful ways and we repent. We don't just want to know about you, we want to know you more. All authority in heaven and earth is yours. 
understanding But I know you are, you promise You are strong and you are kind With every fiber of my Your word is true. Your word is truth. Your word is light. Your word is hope. And your word is life. Your word is truth. Your word is light. Your word is hope. song this morning. It's called Canvas and Clay, and uh, this song's been on my radar for a couple weeks, and it's just uh, really stood out to me and been on repeat, and when I introduced it to the worship team, a lot of them said the same thing. Uh, so it's, it's a really powerful song, and I, I think God's using it uh, all over the place, and we're excited to teach it here. But th this whole concept uh, is, is brought up over and over in the song. You're an artist and a potter, and I'm the canvas and the clay. And I've heard the potter and the clay uh, analogy before, um, but to just repeat it over and over, I know it's just uh, done something in my heart that, that I hadn't thought of before, or hadn't, it just hadn't occurred to me, um, and, and as we're talking about discipleship, we've been on this discipleship uh, theme for, for over a month now, uh, that, that's what it is, God, God's never finished with us, on this side of eternity, He's not finished with us, He's continuing to, to mold us into uh, to something new or to paint something beautiful in our lives. And even when we don't see it, even when we can't feel it at the time, he's still working. Uh, so the tag at the end of this song says, you're not finished with me, you're not finished with me yet. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a humbling thing to know God's not done. I, I still need work done on me. But man, it's such a freeing thing to know. I'm not the one doing the work. It's God. Uh, so we're, we're excited to teach this song to you. We're going to teach you the chorus. I need to lean down and pick up my pick first. I couldn't think of a good way to do that smoothly. Okay, now that I have a guitar pick, we can teach you the song. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your let's sing that again you make all things work together 
for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for My mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, and I doubted, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a part of it, I'm the candid same play. You make all things. Work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name.
finished with me, yes. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me, yes. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me, yes. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me, yes. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. Father, as Scott pointed out and we opened the service this morning, I'm sure there's people sitting here that have received bad phone calls this week. Difficulties and struggles and trials within a family. Maybe some bad health news. Whatever the case may be, Father, you are working in the midst of that. You're not finished yet. You give the opportunity for repentance as we're reminded perhaps of failures and flaws from the past. You give us the opportunity for repentance and a fresh, clean slate because you are the author. You are the painter. The canvas can be wiped clean, Father. We just thank you and praise you for the forgiveness of sins that you provide and for the promise of the fact that you, Father, are intimately involved, intimately engaged in our lives. We lift this up to you this morning and just pray your blessing, your peace upon each person here. We commit this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Children, you are dismissed out the doors over here to my right. Twenty years ago, it was the vision of Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church under the leadership of Pastor Jim Laird to plant a church in Saxton on the other side of the mountain. Uh, the church was planted. Many of some of the folks that helped with that initial plant are here. I look around, I see some of them that worked on that team. And the church was planted over there by the name of Living Hope. And about two years into the initiation of that church, uh, the church called Pastor Bill Hall and uh, Linda and his family to uh, lead that church, and they have done an outstanding job over there. Every now and then, Bill comes over, and this side of the mountain, we do permit that. We do permit people <laughs> to come back and forth. We permit him to come over to this side of the mountain, as he has often permitted us to go over to that side and minister together. And so uh, he's going to come this morning and share a little bit about Living Hope and then uh, preach the Word of God to us. So, Bill, come and join us. We want to thank you for your prayers and your financial support. And the name of the church is Living Hope, and it's taken out of 1 Peter chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 3, that he is our living hope. We'll go to the next slide. This is a picture of the front of the church and during Easter time, and we rent the building there, and we've been there for at least 20 years. One next. This is, uh, we're, we major in our kids' ministry, and this is Ono the Clown who made a visit one Sunday morning, and we had a great time. We also made some shadow boxes a couple weeks ago in the kids on creation, and they are sharing those, and we had several families who never come, came to see their kids share their shadow boxes. We also do a lot of outreaches, and this is the street scene. We, do, we hold that the first August, first Saturday in August, and there's all kinds of things going on. There's 70 vendors, seven or 800 people come by. We have a number of kids' games that are free, and we set up a booth, and we have face painting, and we made, out, made bracelets, the kids made bracelets, and they also were able to make um, chocolate Bibles. And this is our community worship service, and we had a number of churches get together at the broad top, and a number of the teens from the Martinsburg Church came and led us and worship. And momentum has been a big deal for us. We had four teens go this year, and the one in the middle there is Lily. She's been with us for four, since she's been four years old, and God has been working in her life, and she just graduated. So we're excited about that and very proud of her. And we have several outreaches coming up, and one of them is our Halloween outreach. 
and we have five, six hundred people come by, and we just set up tables in front of the church. We give out candy, we give out a brochure of the church, and we just share the love of Christ. And we have another outreach coming up, and it's uh, Christmas, and we open up the church to the community. This is the bell choir from the local high school. They do two performances. Plus, we have the lighting of the Christmas tree, and all this takes place right in front of the church. In fact, that picture is just right from our front door. We have seven, 800, 900 people show up. Santa shows up on a fire truck, and they, we just have a great time sharing, again, the love of Christ. Do you have passion for Jesus? Do you remember the first time that you had first love? I remember the first time her name was Becky. I was in the sixth grade, and we had this sports banquet. And all the guys were asking a date. So I got the nerve up to ask her. And I was so elated that she said yes. I don't remember anything else about it. I don't remember what we ate. I know nothing about it. I just know we had a great time. You know, there's nothing so incredible as seeing a bride going down the aisle in her beautiful white dress and the sparkle in her eye, looking forward to spend the rest of her life with her love. She's full of love and passion and romance. And they look forward to spending the rest of their lives together. And, and before they tied the knot, they, they went out and did things together. They went on numerous dates and went out to eat. And they just spent time together. And then they tied the knot. And then as the years went by, the flame of romance began to flicker. They became consumed with their own interest. Their conversations became shallow. And they didn't spend much time together. And even though they slept in the same bed, their hearts were miles and miles apart. Don't get me wrong. The guy was a great guy. I mean, he did everything. He worked hard. He supported his family but he became emotionally cold and detached from his wife. He maintained a high degree of purity, but he lost his passion. And she tried to talk to him, but he just kind of shrugged it off and said, well, that doesn't really matter. And then one day, she came home and she was gone. She got tired of enduring that loveless marriage and she said, I had enough. And she went out elsewhere to look for someone else. She said, I have a right, quote unquote, to be happy. And she broke her marital vows. She maintained a high passion, but lost her purity. He maintained a high purity, but lost his passion. It's bad enough when that happens in a marriage. But it's even worse when it happens with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Please open up your Bibles, your devices to Revelation chapter 2. It's also found in your pew Bibles on page 595. It's the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 2. We'll begin there in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in the right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Verse 2, I know your deeds, I know your hard work, I know your perseverance, I know that you cannot tolerate the wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have not have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Verse 4, yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen, Repent and do the, things, do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I'll come to you, remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in favor. You hate the practice of the Nickelodeons, which I also hate. The phrase, the phrase we're going to be looking at is love Jesus with all your heart. To love Jesus with all your heart. The church in the city of Ephesus had a high degree of purity, but it lost its spiritual passion. 
on the outside, I mean, they looked great. They sang praise songs. They, they did the small group thing. They, they came on Sunday morning. They gave their money. They, they, they had this great, awesome children's ministry and youth ministry, but inside their hearts were far from God. And, and the writer of Revelation is telling us that we need to get our act together with Jesus. He, he praised them for their purity, but criticized them for their lack of loving Jesus. Now, some of the background of Ephesus, you'll see there that the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the Ephesians. We also see there was an important city. There's about a half million people. You also know they're over about a thousand years old, the city, and they also worship the Diana. You also know, too, we go to the next one, next one. There was also, they had lighted seats and they had um, lighted streets and they had paved roads and they had a large public bathrooms and they had a 25,000 seat auditorium or amphitheater and the Apostle Paul was part of that. And he, we also know he wrote a letter to the Ephesians and we also know that he spent three years there as our pastor teacher. What a foundation. What, what a way to have the Apostle Paul, your pastor, your teacher. It was also along a postal route. You'll notice that um, John is writing to seven churches, and the Ephesus is the church down below, and it's located in Asia Minor, which is present-day what? Turkey. And that Turkey has been in our headlines this last week. And the first thing we're going to see here, also he's writing from the island of Patmos as he's writing to these seven churches. You'll see in verses 2, 3, and verse 6 that there is high praise for their purity. They had their act together. I mean, this church was a busy church, a hard-working church. They, they were a ministry-minded congregation. They just didn't pat themselves on the back. They were eager to serve the Lord. I mean, they had their calendar filled with all kinds of events and meetings. They had light up the night and mops and prayer meetings and men's retreat. They were an active congregation. And he tells us in verse 2, I know. I know. This is Jesus. If you go back to chapter 1, you'll find out that, that Jesus is involved in this. And Jesus says, I know. I know your deeds. I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. They behave properly. They serve faithfully. And they believe correctly. As a group of false teachers came in to influence the church, they were called the apostles. And they checked them out. They checked out their heresy. They, they saw that they were false. And they proved them that they were not right. According to verse 3, this church endured hardship. I mean, it wasn't easy being a believer there in Ephesus. I mean, it was tough to be a light in a dark world. They were not politically correct. In other words, they stood against abortion. They towed the line against anti-Christian philosophies and trends. And in verse 6, we also see that Jesus praises them for hating the practice of the Nicolonians. The Nickelodeons believed in compromise. In other words, you can have it both ways. You can worship God, small g, and still be a believer. There is no separation between worship between Diana or Jesus or Jesus or Zeus. I mean, it was tough being a believer at that time in that city. I mean, everything around you pointed towards the gods. I mean, that was your culture. That was your way of life. That's the way you live. And, and you were raised up in that. I mean, your, your parents did that. Your brothers and sisters did that. Your, your aunts and uncles and your cousins. I mean, it was just the center of your life. It was your way of life. Every aspect of your life was to worship these gods, this culture, or maybe the emperor. It was tough to be a believer. You know, it's something like that today. You know, everyone is doing it. It's okay. 
We don't need any self-control. It's my body. It's okay to sleep around and fool around. I can do what I want. I can go to church on Sunday and act like a believer, and then Monday through Saturday, I can just live it up. Well, these believers faced all this stuff, and yet they towed the line. They said, no way. And Jesus had high praise for them. He said, great job. They didn't cross the line in the sand. That was good. They loved Jesus with all their heart. They were loving Jesus, or were they? Nearly a perfect church. Four praises. Not bad. But, you know, that's a good grade. Four out of five but not for Jesus. There is one criticism that Jesus had. It's found in verse 4. Even though they maintained their purity, they were still a perfect church. They still had one complaint against them. Their beliefs, their behaviors were praiseworthy, but their heart was miles from God. Now, it's so easy for us to miss this point to gloss over it and say, who cares? But Jesus does. There's a Danish philosopher by the name of Kierkegaard, and he tells a story of a make-believe country in which only ducks live. One Sunday morning, all the ducks came into church, and they waddled down the aisle, and they looked in, and, and they sat in their pews and squatted. And then the duck minister took his place behind the pulpit, and he opened up the duck Bible and read, ducks! You have wings, and with your wings you can fly. You can soar in the sky. Use your wings. And all the ducks yelled, Amen. And they waddled out. See, don't miss it. It's so easy to miss this. You've come here this morning to meet with God. Engage your soul in God Almighty. Because we can see in verse 4 that they left their first love. See, Jesus is charging them that they have left their first love. They lost their passion for Jesus. The same passion that they had once when they first were a believer. See, they got to the point that they loved God's truth more than they loved God. And they were going through the motions of church. They had no heart in it. They were mouthing the words of the songs they sang, but there was no meeting. The business of life had taken over and they had no time for Jesus. See, their relationship was like God, was like the the guy when we first talked about in the marriage who was cold to his wife. On the outside, they look good, they're honest, they're hardworking, they're faithful, but they lost their passion. And Jesus tells us in verse 5, here's what you need to do. You need to rekindle the old flame. And he warned them, if they don't repent, he says, I'm going to remove your lampstand from you. Now, what does that mean? That means that you're going to be ineffective. You're going to be ineffective as a church, as a person. In other words, it's like a marriage. They they, they say, we're going to stay together for the kid's sake. We're going to hang in there for the kid's sake, but there's no affection. There's no passion. There's no zeal. And that's what can happen to us. We lose our passion. And Jesus says, I want you to be a five. Not a four out of five. I want you to be pure, and I want you to have passion. Now, here's how I define passion. Passion is you can't wait to be with Jesus. When you go to bed, what is racing through your mind? All the worries and stress of that day? Or is it Jesus? Or when you wake up in the morning, besides the bathroom urge, we all have that, what's in your mind? Is it Jesus? Is Jesus part of your everyday life? Do you have an incredible passion for him? Does your soul desire to be with Jesus? The text this morning is addressing a church. 
And we need to address our church. And we need to ask the question, are we a four or a five? Now, I know without question you're a four, but are you a five? And only you can answer that. You know, I love this church. I've been part of this church for many years. My son works as a leader in the youth group, and my granddaughter, who is four, has just started attending the kids' program. And you know, she calls this my church, and she's only gone four times. <laughs> Figure that. But remember, as believers, we are the church. In other words, you is the church. And since you is the church, does this verse describe your relationship with God? Have you left or forsaken your first love? Have you become preoccupied with other things and neglected the things of God? See, the ultimate question is, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Well, I serve him. I do ministry. I give my money. I give my time. I didn't ask that. Do you love Jesus? Because many times we think doing things for Jesus is a substitute for loving him. And I am guilty of that. I do this for him. And he'll love me more. He'll bless me more. See, I put God in a box. And I check off the good deeds. And I hope God will bless me more so easy to fall into this performance-based relationship. I mean, it happens in marriage all the time. Maybe you have a set time for dinner, and it, and it doesn't happen for some reason, so you sulk like a seven-year-old. Or your husband forgets about your anniversary, and he's in the doghouse not for the week or a month, but for the year. Yeah, and, and you always bring up, remember when? Many marriages are based on performance. If you do this for me, you'll really get what you want tonight. It becomes conditional. And see, the same thing happens in the Christian life. You're newly saved and you're on fire for Jesus. Then over time, it turns into a performance-based relationship. So what should our motive be? We love Jesus. We do it for Jesus. We work in the nursery for Jesus, not out of guilt. We love Jesus to teach our kids. We do it because we love Jesus and fill in the blank. Why do you read your Bibles? Because you love Jesus. It's that simple. Don't make it complicated. If you have left your first love, you need to get started back. You need to get back to it. And that means to read your Bible and to pray, to take time out for Jesus. I mean, there are many, many Bible plans out there. But I think this one is really good. I just learned about it, and you can, you can look it up, the notes on it, you version. And there's over 300 million downloads of this. It's a great way to spend time with Jesus. They have a verse of the day, and you can flip that on, and you can just read that over wherever you're at in the morning or evening or at work or whatever, and think about it. See, you need to spend time with God. And then they have all kinds of devotional plans wrapped up in that app. You have it on your smartphone. You can have it on your, your notes, on your notebook. You can have it downloaded on your computer. There's just so many ways you can use this app. But it's so easy to have that app right on your phone, and guess what? You never use it. So you got to make a habit of doing it. you got to start small and develop big. The God of the universe who created the earth and us as humans desires a relationship with you. I mean, that blows me away, that God is interested in me. And you always have time to do God's will. That's an absolute. And his will is for you to have a vital relationship with him. In other words, we don't have any excuses. This is what God wants more than anything.
for us is for you to engage with Jesus, allowing the Spirit of God to penetrate your soul. You know, those stresses of life, those money issues, those marriage issues, maybe it's addiction issues, you'll be able to deal with them. Why? Because you're in love with Jesus. You're able to make those wise decisions in life about the college you need to go to, or the business deal, or the career change, or you allow your daughter to date this particular guy, or should you buy this house? God will give you those answers. But you got to be in that relationship with him. you got to engage him. you got to be plugged in. You can be on the same track, the same wavelength with Jesus. You know, hunting season's here, and I always look forward to hunting season. And I just, you know, it's here now. And, you know, while you're waiting for that deer, think about this. Think about the things of Jesus. Engage your relationship with him. Some of my best spiritual times is when I'm alone in the woods with Jesus. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3 that I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And that word know is more than just cognitive understanding. It's to experience Jesus in your everyday life. If you've lost your passion, I encourage you to listen to Jesus' words and his warning. And don't become an ineffective believer. He tells us we need to repent. And he even mentions it twice in that passage. That that's a change of heart. It's more than just the mind, it's the heart. That God wants us to take action and to change the way we live. Well, you say, hey, I already have a good relationship with Jesus. Well, make it a great relationship. Make it an excellent relationship. Or maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know, I don't even know what you're talking about. I, I don't have a relationship with Christ. You know, this is a great time to have it. To know Jesus as your personal Savior. Because it tells us in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, it tells us, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and camped among us, tabernacled among us, lived among us for 33 and a half years, and then died on a cross and rose again so that you and I can have eternal life. Jesus is that bridge. It tells us, for the wages of sin is a free gift of Jesus Christ. Do you know him as Savior? Is he part of your heart, part of your life? When we leave here this morning, don't waddle out of here. Fly out of here. Love Jesus with all your heart. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much that we can take this time to engage with you, to look at the word of God, and to allow you to penetrate our heart. We just don't want to check off this morning and say, I've been here this morning. But we want to deal with our heart and deal with those issues that we are facing. And maybe we're just, we're just dealing with all kinds of stuff in our life right now. There's all kinds of things happening. Let me ask you, have you met with Jesus? Have you met with him this week, this morning, whenever, this evening? Are you going to meet with him? Meet with him. Spend time with Jesus. Rekindle your relationship. Tell him that. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. As we sing, we're declaring the God's truth from his word, and we're putting our prayers to melody. And this song is just such a beautiful prayer to follow up what Pastor Bill shared with us. So please sing this prayer along with us.
that's true of our hearts, that that's our prayers we leave this morning, that you give us a, a pure and a holy passion to know and follow a heart after you. I pray that that's our prayers we leave this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.